Okay, we're back live in San Francisco for the post EMC v, v spec event. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com. This is SiliconAngle's The Cube, where we go out to the events and cover them and extract the signal from the noise and wrap that into uh, analysis and commentary. With, I'm here with my co-host. I'm Dave Vellante of Wikibon.org, and we've got a great guest today from VMware, Hadam Nagib. Uh, welcome to the Cube, Hadam. You manage the Cisco, the EMC, and the VCE relationships, correct? That is correct. Thank uh, you very much for having me today. Great to have you. So, um, so what's that all about? Tell us, you know, what that means that your team manages those relationships. What does that entail? So, from a VMware perspective, uh, we have very deep um, strategic relationships with Cisco, EMC, and VCE as partners. Uh, those relationships encompass both go-to-market activities that we do, so selling together, the marketing, the messaging, but also extensive engineering work that the two companies uh, would do together uh, as, uh, as two-way relationships to help expand the, uh, the adoption of virtualization and their, uh, their infrastructure components into the market. So this is the, v the VCE piece is interesting because you do Cisco, EMC, and VCE. You are VMware, which is one-third of the the relationship, and then Cisco EMC, the other two-thirds. There's like an Excel circular reference in there, isn't it? Uh, you guys, I know you swap a lot of DNA between those three organizations. As, we manage uh, our three-way and two-way relationships as, as, effe as effectively as we can. So, yeah. for, so from, a, from a, a technology standpoint, where do you spend the most time? Is it obviously vSphere vSphere and Vue, or is it? Is it? Uh, I, th I think it, it crosses all levels of the platform from a VMware perspective. Uh, vSphere, of course, being the kind of the foundation mm -hmm. Um, and having a, a lot of differentiation on both the storage and the server side, making it critical for both Cisco and EMC. Uh, converged infrastructure really bringing to bear, I think, a new paradigm within how customers are consuming uh, their infrastructure and virtualization. So the management story becomes really interesting and a lot of work being done with uh, VCE around how we have a, a unified management story to help uh, kind of accelerate the adoption of we've, that. We've been technology. talking on theCUBE a lot about how and every, every guest we've talked to, going back on at least a year, Dave, has been talking about how cloud, mobile and social, mainly cloud, re reminds them of client server, right? And that enabled a lot, right? Mini computers and LANs, et cetera. But now with cloud, that kind of dynamic is really kind of happening in a different way, more open, more stack choice, a few other things. I see the data centers impacted heavily in the enterprise side. Um, with client server came a slew of opportunities for, for partners and innovation in particular. Uh, what do you see out there that's going on in the data center, specifically around the infrastructure, and what it needs to support, given this heavy focus of apps, agile, and mobile? Um, what are the new areas that are just like, wow, we saw that coming, it's ready for prime time, or we didn't see this coming, and it's a new trend? What are you seeing as those core enablers? I think from, from the customer's perspective, uh, from an IT perspective, and we look at the end customer of who we're really trying to serve, they're under an enormous amount of pressure to accelerate their SLA back to their end business customers. Mm -hmm. um, and they're seeing the consumerization of IT, where people outside of a traditional technical background are gaining access to technology, be that through mobile devices, be that through you know, Facebook and social media, in a way that the business needs to be able to accommodate and accelerate as quickly as possible. So virtualization was kind of that first impact that happened to the data center, which created, I think, a convergence of storage, network, compute. Um, but what's happening a lot, what we see, is that end customers want to spend less time putting things together and more time building business applications that are going to provide value to, to their end customers, um, less time maintaining the infrastructure and the, 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 um, the putting of the pieces together, and, and more time really optimizing for a more cost-effective and cost-based solution back to their, uh, to their end customers. So when you look at, um, and the insurance company is a great example, right? Being able to move their applications to be much more web and so social media aware and so forth is a top priority for them. Access on an iPad, on an iPhone. And data is a heart of that problem, right? Data is a, a, a great example, right? I got data that's going to come from a big data perspective to all different uh, platforms that I need to manage. Um, why vSpecs is fantastic is because it brings together a solution architecture to those uh, end customers that takes away them having to put all these pieces together and allows them to leverage their resources more effectively to address the core problems for their business. We talked a lot about this in theCUBE, John, um, and Adam, you just mentioned it, that IT is under tremendous pressure to deliver better SLAs, and a big part of that is if they don't, they're going to get outsourced. Um, and, you know, there have been people in the cube said, hey, the traditional IT shop is 10 years behind you know, Google and Facebook in terms of you know, innovating with, with architecture. 
Um, but yet, the IT is a very interesting organism. John, you mentioned client server, right? <laughs> um, IT eventually embraced it. They're very resistant to change, but eventually they embrace it and then sort of figure it out. Um, well, I, what I, do you see there? I, I see we put on them, so I have an IT background. I started off my career in, in an IT organization and uh, application development. Uh, they have constraints that other companies don't have to deal with or the departments don't have to deal with in terms of compliance and security and expectation. When email is not working or when there's a security breach, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on an IT organization to make sure that these things never happen. Um, and that does, I think, force them to have to be a little more rigid and a little more uh, slower in adopting new technologies. Um, hopefully things like what we're doing with our partners around um, the solution innovation that we're doing, but also with virtualization with VMware, uh, give them the flexibility to accelerate some of the adoptions associated with that, uh, because their constraints are, are really holding back, I think, uh, a lot of the, uh, the, the differentiation that they want the business to be able to drive when they look at uh, the compliance they have to map and the security they have to map and so forth. So the fact that you're an IT practitioner, a former IT practitioner, is, is, is quite interesting. But So you, we all remember the Nick Carr book, IT, you know, does it matter, does IT matter? Mm -hmm. And the premise of the book was IT doesn't deliver a competitive advantage. And then since that book, you've seen Google, <laughs> Facebook, Zynga, clearly IT gives competitive advantage. Now, maybe he would argue today, yes, but for the vast majority of companies, it, it doesn't. And I, I would even debate that. Um, are, I want your take on that in terms of, do you see that IT, especially given data and analytics and big data, as really able to deliver competitive advantage, even as um, brokers of the cloud? Um, what's your take on that? I don't think that that has changed. I think IT does give competitive advantage. I think your examples are, are spot on. I think there are examples when you look at a company like Amazon and its, its ability to really offer to its end customers a unique user experience. That's all IT, IT, right. IT, IT based. Show. We have to, I think, distinguish between um, the IT of uh, here's your Windows laptop, mm -hmm. right, and you know, go do what your Word document has to provide for you versus the IT that provides uh, the American Airlines uh, Sabre system and gave uh, us uh, the ability to really make reservations online. Those are two different ITs, and I think there's a, a clamoring in the business to become more of that innovative side of IT, the Google, the Facebook type of capabilities, where businesses really look to that to be able to succeed. Um, the less work that has to be done on plugging in servers and storage, and the more work that can be done on you know, optimizing around an application user experience and giving people the mobility to, to reach their work anywhere they want to be able to do it, uh, the more that competitive advantage becomes a critical success factor. And, and bringing it back to convergence, and you know, generally in vSpecs uh, specifically, uh, John's team at Silicon Angle uh, launched a new publication called DevOps Angle. Mm. And you know, this is a very labor-intensive business we're in. Um, the, uh, the, the spending on labor has increased about two and a half X in the last 12, 13 years in IT. Um, so you guys have been following the DevOps trend are you seeing that occur? Will this converged infrastructure trend facilitate the intersection of development and, and operations so that there is more cross-training so that we can truly attack that labor problem? Because the, the premise is it's not just infrastructure. There's got to be processes that take advantage of that new infrastructure. What do you see there? I think what we're seeing um, is the infrastructure having to, as it becomes more converged, becoming more cloud aware. So the concepts of silos that used to exist around I'm a storage specialist or I'm a network specialist. Uh, when virtualization started to bring all that together, everybody had to become a specialist across all those pieces. So now the virtualization person at the company really does bring together all those, all those components together. And as they look at a private, hybrid, public cloud strategy, they have to be cognizant of scalability and mobility concepts that they would have not had to be in, in a more confined IT organization. The developer used to think about how do I get the device driver for a specific piece of, uh, of hardware to work very properly with, with the application. That paradigm is now going away and they're building applications when you look at some of the stuff we're doing with Spring, uh, when you look at the vFabric concepts, those are now becoming cloud aware types of applications where, where the application sits, where it gains its data, are no longer part of that. So I think the convergence of the dev and the ops, I think you, you bring that up very nicely. I think it's coming together and they're, they're merging towards a, a much more SaaS and cloud aware type of architecture that they've got to be cognizant of as, as they develop their you know, production, test, and, and development environments. So 
You know, I've been an observer of this converged infrastructure trend since sort of VCE kicked it off. And then you saw Oracle with Exadata and then sort of HP came in a big way. Certainly, you know, NetApp and now Dell and IBM yesterday, big announcement uh, and others. Um, everybody's saying the same thing. They talk about simplification, speed to deployment, you know, integrated infrastructure, reducing risk. As a practitioner, how do you differentiate? How do you squint through all the sort of marketing and really get down to what's different? What's different between each of the different approaches? Yeah, the different approaches. I mean, how, how do I discern where, where value really is? If, if, if everybody's saying the same thing in the same message, how do you determine, is there a difference? How do you determine the BS from the reality, right? Because, you know, CIO looks at, you know, you've been in IT. Hey, I got a business to run. I got vendors coming in, doing pitches, telling me their bridge is better to cross than the other guys. But all this stuff's going on. With everyone kind of going now into the converged party, they're all kind of looking the same. You, so you how do you vet that? Tell your you know, VMware and you know, your, 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 your approach. At the end of the day, it comes down to VMware, value, Cisco, but the EMC. value propositions are kind of men, kind of coming together. They're all copying each other or copying BCE, depending on how you look at it. Um, how do you kind of differentiate that? I think you've got to look at, so I think you, you bring up a really good point. I mean, two years ago when VCE came to the market with this, the VMware component was the foundation of, of what was driving this converged infrastructure mm -hmm. philosophy. Um, VMware is not simply just the hypervisor. We bring to bear a huge amount of, of, of technology and features that cross all different layers of the IT infrastructure, from the end user, um, the desktop components, to the application development. And, and so those who adopted that converged infrastructure paradigm, who recognized it not as a hardware play, but as a cloud play, and leveraged the software assets more effectively, I think that brings a level of differentiation that I think a, an end customer needs to look at. Am I looking at the, uh, the software piece as an OS in this, or am I looking at it as a true enabler from both a management perspective, an automation perspective, and a simplicity perspective? How deep is, the, uh, is that convergence occurring? Uh, on that software layer is a key differentiator for a lot of for a lot of how. Uh, Sasha, you mentioned Spring them. earlier, so so we have like one minute left. So the final question will be: Okay, with the barrage of frameworks hitting this the scene, we're seeing, you know, I we covered one, or I think we covered one yesterday. At least I drafted something up. Meteor is a new framework was launched yesterday. The guys who did Etherpad um, launched one, very compelling. HTML5. We've seen a lot of mobile stuff. Very turnkey software development environments. Very much like a, the old Visual Studio kind of stuff out there in the old days. Like so, with that barrage of software, what has to be supported now grows. So it's now the other problem. The hard the this, the infrastructure needs to be aware of more apps. So. How do you talk about that in, in terms of like from the st looking up to the apps as new apps come in? How do you determine what framework fits where? So I think it's it's a great question. You know, one of the things I've been at VMware for six years, and you know, we started off as very much an infrastructure focused company, uh, but since Paul has has come in as the as the CEO, you've seen a, a dramatic shift in our focus to really not just look at the infrastructure, but look at developers and developers as being. Um, kind of at the flagship of where technology innovation is going. There's a small number of developers in the world, and when they adopt a new technology, it completely changes how the infrastructure is going to be. It's not the other way around, right? We didn't get into client server because somebody thought this type of connectivity would work better. It's because Power Builder and Visual Basic and a bunch of different ways of looking at the application drove the infrastructure to make that modification. Our work nice. from a I asked Pat Gelsky that question two years ago, and he gave me kind of the middle of the road answer. Remember that, Dave? <laughs> yes, I do. Which <laughs> powers what? Infrastructure enable software or the other way around? Nice. Um, <laughs> Thanks for aligning with my answer. Well, I've, <laughs> Although I've, Pat was kind of straddling the fence. I'd say he was aligning with me too, but. You know, in, in many ways, from an end customer perspective, it's that experience that will define what that infrastructure is going to be. Look at the Apple App Store. When that thing exploded, that's what made the iPad and the and the uh, the iPhone successful. But I mean, Instagram wouldn't have sold for a billion dollars if there was no App Store. Right. Period. And that, they just launched Android three days before they sold. It's an a app billion dollar world. business in two years because of Apple. It's the same paradigm in the entertainment business, right? TV shows are what make the technology right. not. Necessarily. So, is there an Instagram in the IT environment? The answer is there will be not necessarily that huge valuation, but you know, some innovation will happen. A flower will bloom. I think what you're going to see is what we experience out of work is going to converge much more closely to what we're going to be at work. It's actually dramatic how different it is when you're at work 
than when you're not. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but it's getting better. It's getting, it's closer. getting better. It's getting closer. But you know, the at least you bring an the, iPhone to work, right? True. Getting virtualization on the desktop, things are happening. But you know, the experience of gaining a new application and being able to have your, you know, your personality mapped to that application. Can you imagine an internal conversation in the in accounting department, basically <laughs> competing for the desktop app for the users internally? You know, five that could be apps. the future. It could be the future. Okay, uh, we got a break. Any final questions? No, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, Adam, that was great. I really Thank you. appreciate you coming. I really appreciate you. coming. Okay, up and, uh, we'll be right back with our next guest. Take a short break. We'll be right back. Code ciphers and code breakers have been around since the beginning of time. Julius Caesar used ciphers to communicate with his armies. Secret coded messages were brought as evidence of treachery in the trial against Mary, Queen of Scots. She lost her case and her head. The German military believed their World War II Enigma machine generated an unbreakable code, which was soon cracked and exploited by the Allies. But today's digital society poses even greater opportunities for code breakers, criminals, hackers, and nation states who wish to shatter encrypted websites and systems to access, steal, and sometimes destroy what's inside. More than 21,000 people attended the most recent RSA security conference in San Francisco entitled, The Great Cipher is Mightier Than the Sword, to learn from the best cryptographers and internet security experts what they can do to keep themselves and their businesses safe from attack. RSA conference in beautiful San Francisco. Our industry has succeeded in making the internet, with all its weaknesses and idiosyncrasies, safe enough to transform the world. With increased speed, agility, and cunning, Attackers are taking advantage of gaps in security resulting from the openness in today's hyper-connected infrastructures. We can ensure that the balance of control of our digital world re remains in the hands of security practitioners. We can give them the tools they need to identify threats quickly and eradicate them. We can give our industry the structures it needs to share intelligence so that we can all be in this fight together and that knowledge gained by any one of us can become power for all of us. Throughout the whole floor, there's just an energy, there's games being played, there's fun, exciting things to see. So I'm going to take a step off of the RSA floor today and look around and see what else and what other fun things I can get into. Actually, I, was a, I did the talk on firewalls. I think it was RSA 1 or RSA 2, and awesome. it was down in the basement of the Fairmont back when it was just this little bitty conference.
know, you got to wonder about these designations, though, because would you really want to go talk to someone who's a troll? Courtney just did. I know. He seemed like a pretty nice guy, <laughs> too. Yeah. Trolls get a bad name. All right, all right. Yeah. I'm so sorry. I apologize to all the trolls out there. That's right. I'm sure you're all lovely people.